I can give you a list of vulnerabilities and you'd think that, great, I now know what my risk is. But the reality in OT is it's not always directly applicable. That's a single external indicator. Welcome everyone to the Industrial Security Podcast. My name is Nate Nelson. I'm here as usual with Andrew Ginter, the Vice President of Industrial Security at Waterfall Security Solutions. He's going to introduce the subject and guest of our show today. Andrew, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you, Nate. Our guest today is Rick Kahn. He is the Vice President of Solutions at Verve Industrial Protection. And we're going to be talking about context for risk. We're going to be talking about patching. We're going to be talking about automation to help us figure out when something is worth patching, when a vulnerability is worth patching, and you know when we should probably let it ride. All right. Then without further ado, here is the interview. Hello, Rick, and thank you for joining us. Uh, before we get started, could you say a few words about yourself and your background and about the good work that you're doing at Verve Industrial? Yes, thank you, Andrew, and I appreciate the opportunity to share with you today and, and discuss. It's always a, a great time chatting with you. Uh, as plugged in as you are, it's always a great discussion. Um, my name is Rick Kahn. Uh, I'm the VP of Solutions for Verve Industrial Protection. Uh, we're a vendor-neutral, uh, multi-function shop that uh, provides both software and services exclusively to the OT space. Um, we've been around for 30 years, actually, uh, privately funded. Uh, self-grown, organically grown. Uh, I personally have been in the OT business for 22 years. Um, I started at a company called Matricon, uh, building the ICS or industrial control uh, security uh, consulting space. We then got picked up by a company called Honeywell, um, where I was a global business development uh, for them for a few years before coming back to a vendor neutral perspective where I am now. Um, and again, appreciate the opportunity today. Thanks for that. Um our topic today is risk in context. Can you tell us, you know, what is that? And and you may maybe give us an example or two. Yeah, this is the the gist of what I want to talk about today. We can we lots of lots to unpack here. Um, the problem that I'm seeing more and more organization, not just me, that we as a company and, and our industry clients and their peers are all starting to realize is that. Um, uh, the traditional IT approach where you have very cool tools, individual specialty tools and specialty people is interesting, but it's a singular point of perspective, right? So uh, I can give you a list of vulnerabilities and you'd think that, great, I now know what my risk is. But the reality in OT is it's not always directly applicable. That's a single external indicator. It doesn't include anything to do with whether that's a big deal for you, the owner operator, or on this particular asset or in a particular facility. Um, and so what we're seeing is that people are needing more and more context. And this is especially too true on a couple of fronts. Um, number one, we don't have enough staff to address all the vulnerabilities. I mean, we turned on our vulnerability mapping at a, a midstream gas company the other day, and literally at their flagship site was 23,000 vulnerabilities. Um, and you're never going to get that to zero, and you're not sure even where you should probably start unless you have some sort of context. So a singular view isn't good enough. And it's actually something we've been struggling with for many years. I remember about 10 years ago going into a, uh, an air separation unit and the plant manager said, you're going to do an assessment and you're going to tell me that I don't change passwords and I don't patch. How the heck does that help me? Um, and so on the front of being able to take those scarce resources and focus them on the things we need to, i.e. The, the, the lack of staff, the lack of time, um, the ability to look at what truly is effective for OT which isn't always everything because everything can't be Windows 11 and patched every Tuesday, um, but also the nature of OT in that we can't do plan A, i.e. the patching necessarily. We need to do plan B and C and D or compensating controls or as some interestingly creative marketing people have started to call virtual patching. If we can't apply BlueKeep, can we at least disable remote desktop or the guest account? Well, I don't know the answer to that unless I know what that system does and what function it provides to operations. So the gist of this is, any singular indicator of risk, i.e. an external penetration, you know, uh, uh, denial of service attempt or a list of vulnerabilities or a, a patching tool in and of itself is not enough to provide, you know, our audience the, the detail that they need to be able to act 
uh, appropriately and effectively and efficiently. Andrew, the way that he's uh, talking there, it reminds me vaguely of an episode that we did some time ago with a guest who was talking about uh, s- like site-specific vulnerability that um, that you can't categorize or that you shouldn't rather categorize uh, vulnerabilities in a broader sense that he was looking into specific uh, sites and in specific industries and evaluating how they affected those specific plants. And it was sort of a different alternative to the usual uh, CVE kind of way of doing things. Um, can you remind me uh, what the, the name of the guest was there? Yeah, that that was uh, Thomas Schmidt from the, uh, the BSI, which is the German Office for Information Security. And he was talking about SSVC, so Stakeholder Specific Vulnerability Categorization. This was a, a, a new standard. This was six months ago, a new standard to make uh, decisions about whether to apply patches for vulnerabilities. And, uh, you know, Verve, Verve Industrial Protection is one of the vendors in the space. They have automation for SSVC. And, and Rick is going to say more, you know, much more about that in, in just a moment. So, I mean, I agree with all that in principle, um, you know, but it's sort of, what's the right word? These are great principles, but if I have, you know, uh, 30 sites, each of them has, you know, 600 PLCs and who knows what other kinds of, of, you know, industrial internet and, you know, everything has a CPU nowadays. Um, You know, it's great to say I can make risk-based decisions like that. It's another thing to say, do I actually understand all of my tens of thousands of devices and which of them I should manage how, how can you, you know, is there, is there, is there a way to get insight? Is there a way to get automation instead of saying, you know, evaluate every one of my 50,000 assets myself? Yeah, no, great question. And, and, you know, you're right. Like it, uh, when I talk about the, the, the risk index or an, an individual measure as not being enough, I mean, you look at, you look at the NVD score and it's, it's got a ranking and it's got why it got to that ranking. There's, there's components in there, but you've raised the other point is how do I take that and scale it both in volume, but also there are, as you know, nuances within those 60 sites or 30 sites in the PLC. Some of them do critical safety things. Some of them do other things. And so as soon as you start to unpack this a bit, you realize that you need a great level of detail from multiple perspectives. Um, so let me, let me just sort of walk through how we help clients to build that perspective and what we call a three-dimensional view of the asset. Um, and so the first and foremost is going to the source. There absolutely has to be an inventory. If you remember our last podcast, we talked about building a proper inventory and it never more now more than ever. It's, it's the most important thing we're seeing that people are starting to realize is um, you need to go directly to the asset. The first source of data in building this bigger picture view to be able to provide context beyond a single measure is to pull in multiple measures of the asset. And so the first source is the asset itself. Can we figure out what it is? Windows, Linux, Unix, uh, networking gear, PLCs, relays, controllers, what the manufacturer is, whatever we can glean from that endpoint. The more data we can get from that, the more equipped we are to pivot to different scenarios and situations in ascertaining and actually measuring risk for our organization. Um, That's the first bit of data. The second bit of data, once you've built that information, and by the way, we advocate for a direct approach going right onto the OS and going right directly to the PLCs, not going to uh, intermediary databases or relying on what I'm hearing through traffic. I want to go to the source. I want to ask and get answered the questions I need to know, not hope that I hear them or hope that I'm listening to all of the devices. So we get all that data. We automate it into a central database. At that central database is where we invest to gather Uh, and collect and aggregate all the other data sources that are available to these operators. The very first one is really quite simple. We take that database once we built it and we work with operations to say, let's put operational impact or user defined tags on these assets, right? So a Triconics or refinery, clearly a safety system, that's a high impact asset. It gets a high impact label because when we go to look at risk, whether that's assessing if it exists and is important to us, or whether we want to turn to remediation tasks like patching or compensating controls, we can then decide which ones we test on, 
i.e. the redundant safety one, or not the, not the safety ones, but the redundant, not so impactful ones, or which ones we need to prioritize in terms of budget and resources, et cetera. So we start with the inventory automatically from the endpoint. We then add user-defined tags and information about it. We can calculate or infer these from the vendor name or from the subnet they're in or whatever, but we usually like to make sure we loop the, the, the plant people in. The tribal knowledge that those, those, those veterans have on the plant floor is, is invaluable. Very, very powerful. Um, so two different data sources starting to build multiple dimensions on the asset. And then the third thing we'll do is we'll go and get third party indicators. Um, and this is where we get the national vulnerability database. We'll bring the, the, the list of vulnerabilities in and we can map them one to one at the database offline from the actual operational environment. So we're very frequently and very thoroughly mapping vulnerabilities against that very detailed inventory. We can also bring in threat feeds and known exploits. So we're going beyond, by the way, you've got a vulnerability and there's exploits out there for it, right? That may increase or decrease your, your urgency. Um, and then the third thing we bring in, of course, is the first line of defense, the patches that may be available for those devices. So we start with the endpoint data first, the tribal knowledge around the importance or impact or, or role of those devices second, third-party indicators of risk in patch threat feeds and, and, and vulnerability data. And then the fourth thing we'll do in that middle layer database that we are compiling all these different dimensions of the asset about, we will go east and west and connect to um, basic building blocks for security tools like the status of your backup or your antivirus. And in multi-vendor environments, the ability to abstract connecting into semantic versus McAfee versus you know, Defender to see if your antivirus is up to date or your whitelisting is in lockdown, to aggregate that into a central view is where the real magic comes. Now, how we do this, to your point in the scenario of 30 sites, is we then cascade any single site or database to a single reporting dashboard. The reporting dashboard is a single, uh, it's a singular view into the entire fleet and it's a read only view. So what we can do then is we have all these different data sources consistently from all of our facilities and across all of our assets. We've got multiple dimensions of potential um, risk, but not just the risk, but the assets impact and compensating controls that may mitigate risk or, or, or narrow down the, the, the concern. Um, and we can see this with a small specialized team fleet-wide. This allows for an organization to build a standard response, a standard um, threshold, if you will, for various risks and activities that they need to uh, act on. Um, and they can then start to remediate with this same technology where it's OT safe. Um, and we can do this in stages, um, but let's, let's circle back there on that one. This is, this is how we want to build the context in the first place. Um, and we want to aggregate it across multiple sites and now give all the power to a, a very specialized team uh, and, and let them start to see what they're looking at. All right. So, so that's, I mean, that's a lot of data. It, you know, it's, it's useful to have that database. It's, it's useful to capture tribal knowledge, but, Still, if we have thousands of assets and, you know, even more data about each of the assets in a database, that's just more information for, you know, my poor, my poor brain to, 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 you know, try and suck in and, and make informed risk decisions is, you know, is there, is there a way to, uh, to, to work with the data once you have it? Yeah, no, that's an absolutely spot on observation. I mean, we talk about 23,000 vulnerabilities and now I added three other dimensions to those 23,000. So what do we do with it? Great question. Um, the most powerful thing that we're doing, and you can actually do multiple things with it, but the most powerful thing you can do with it is to calculate an actual, what we call a residual risk score. So if you were to take those different indicators and we do this with the clients and we, it's automatically done in the software to then report on the dashboard. Um, but the premise behind it is we build indicators of risk and we, we build scores for things we don't like. And it's just like my golf game. It gets really big and huge and ugly real quick. Um, so for example, if uh, a device is considered a high impact, it gets a score of 10. If it's considered low impact, it gets a five. Tribal knowledge now has a score. Um, if it has a critical vulnerability, it gets seven points for every critical vulnerability. It may have multiples. Um, if the backup has failed, right? So all these different data sources can be pulled into a calculation and a score appended to them. And then the true, what we call residual risk, after we've accounted for compensating controls, like the backup is good and whitelisting is in lockdown, so the score comes off. Um, we can build an actual risk score that is OT or, or 
end user specific. And then those scores can be put into thresholds, which then drive governance around behavior. So something that's considered a critical risk, maybe as an org, we decide has to be dealt with within 24 hours, whereas something with a low risk can be calculated to do something within a week or a month. And because it's automatically updating the data and calculating, you are now always looking at a live score. So you extract from the noise the stuff that is a five alarm fire pit have to deal with. Does everybody have their own scoring system? And I, I mean, we've been talking about uh, SSVC, uh, there's CVE, now there's this. I wonder whether all these different systems get confusing after a certain while. Uh, I think the the short answer is yes. Um, the uh, the long answer is, in a sense, this is why, in my understanding, SSBC was invented. Um, it's because the vendors in the space uh, do all they you know they they did all have their own system, and uh, you know the uh, the users uh, the the governments especially said you know here are some minimum criteria that you should be using for these risk decisions. You may be able to get sort of finer grain decisions by doing you know more analysis of the of the risk and the context, but uh, you know here here's a minimum, and so they put SSVC together, and of course you know why would the vendors do not just SSBC and be done with it. It's, I mean, I worked, I've worked for vendors most of my career. One of the ways vendors distinguish each other from each other is the feature sets in their product. So, you know, every vendor out there wants to say, yes, of course we do SSBC and we give you even more power because we do X, Y, and Z in addition. So yeah, it's, it's not surprising that everyone does it differently. Um, this is part of why SSBC exists. In the beginning of the industrial security revolution, engineers were told to use IT security principles. Protect the information we were told. We knew this was a poor fit, but it was all we had. Today, the top security priority at industrial sites is safety. Don't kill anyone. Don't cause an environmental disaster. And the second priority is reliability. Do not shut down our factory or infrastructure. Today, safe and reliable operations use unhackable protections from cyber risks, not just cybersecurity. For a deeper look at the evolution of the revolution, we invite you to download Waterfall's report on the Emerging Consensus for Industrial Security Engineering. You can access the report at the Waterfall website, waterfall-security.com slash engineering dash consensus. Or just go to the resources menu and click on white papers and ebooks. So, just to clarify, um, these these sort of characteristics, uh, you know, did the backup work? Uh, you know, what's the what's the impact of? Are these, in a sense, pre-programmed that that users then populate, or are they sort of user defined? Can the users define the calculation? Or sorry, the uh, the characteristics, and and you know if. If the characteristics are user defined, I, I would assume the calculation has to be user defined. How, how, you know, how? Uh, what's the right word? Customized is this to every site? The calculation itself is something that we ship with a basic sort of structure. If an organization wants to change how it's calculated or uh, emphasize or de-emphasize certain indicators one way or the other, they can. The precursor to that question, though, was the user defined properties. User defined properties are usually set once i.e. it's a high impact asset to operations or it's an inconsequential asset to operations. Um, and those don't typically change. What does change, and therefore we automate, is the presence of vulnerabilities or the version of the software or the, 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 the level of the patching. So where we can automate technical gathering and, and, and technical data, we do. Where we need user defined, we usually establish that up front. It doesn't typically change. I mean, a Triconics is a Triconics. It's safety is safety. It, it doesn't suddenly stop being something. Um, and so we have a combination of sort of set up the automation, set up the tags, and then the actual how you want to calculate is absolutely customizable. As are the labels up front. I mean, if, if we think it's a high impact asset, the client disagrees. It's their it's their database. It's their threshold. They can they can customize it. So, so that makes sense. I mean, you know, you've got automation, you've got a calculation, you can see in your words where the five alarm fires are. Um, what do you do about those fires? Are we talking, you know, patch everything? Are we talking throw some more firewalls rules in there? And, and you know, if you make those changes, um, 
what change do you see in your system? How does, can you give us an example how this works? Yeah, absolutely. And that's the nat- natural follow on. Um, and as you said in the intro, you can't always patch. You need to have, be able to be creative. So th- this is where we sort of double down on the value of that multidimensional view. So I've got a risk. My risk score is automatically calculated. I've got a bunch of really, you know, sort of heavy hitters that look like they're high risk and I need to act upon them. Um, and so now what I do is I go into those individual assets and I look at the components that have added to what the problem is. Um, it's a vulnerability. There's a patch available for it. It's not been applied. Well, that's your first, that's your first path. We want to look at that patch. Can we deploy that patch again with our architecture? Um, we can then do a very safe OT stage sort of approach through the first pass of potentially patching. We will patch, you know, redundant systems, domain controllers, file servers, and we'll bake in a certain version like 2012, make sure it works, and then potentially pass that on to the HMIs and engineering station. So we can do a very staged methodical OT approach. If we can't do the patch though, we can then look at our systems and say, well, what is the risk of this? And one example we had with a client was Bluekeep came out and they couldn't patch for Bluekeep on some other systems. Um, but they didn't want to just live with the risk. So the next thing they did was they said, well, what's wrong with Bluekeep? Um, and so what they did then was it, well, it mostly attacks, you know, the guest account and remote desktop. Well, their 24 seven staffed HMIs probably didn't need remote desktop enabled. And they certainly didn't need the guest account. So then we used the technology to start to disable remote desktop and the guest account again in a very staged approach. Now, if you build it properly in the 30 site scenario that, that you shared with us, you can do this again from a central team that queues this up tease it up for the endpoint and can involve the people at the plants to be able to go ahead um, and be involved in. So it's not a big brother push, but it creates very, very precise or, or precision in deciding what to do and where to do it and going beyond patching to compensating controls. Um, and there's two things in there that we may want to dig deeper into, Andrew, let me know if you, which way you want to go. There is you know, more examples of things you can do beyond patching, but there's also the efficiencies gained by the way that this is architected. Perhaps this is my naivete, but coming from more of an IT background, I'm not quite sure why a lot of the nuance in this discussion ends up factoring into patching. Um, Generally, I've always thought about patching as something that you should do as soon as possible whenever the option is available. But here we're talking about criticality and severity and and all of these factors that seem to suggest that you wouldn't otherwise patch in every given scenario. So why is that? I think it's it's easiest to answer with some examples. Um, On your average you know, IT network, you know, let's, let's leave the, 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 the sort of, leave the specialized IT networks out of it, the, the banking systems and the, even the SAP servers, the ones that are, are handling payroll. Let's leave sort of that critical systems out. You're, you're, you're just your desktop network. You've got a bunch of desktop machines. Um, they are reaching out to the internet every five minutes to fetch email, to send email, to browse the internet, to download stuff. They're really very exposed. Um, and in a sense, they're all the same. They all have the same level of exposure. So yeah, you use the severity and if it's a severity nine, you patch it automatically. And there's, there's not that much decision making going on, on your, that, that kind of IT network kind of, so everyone's most familiar with. Um, but you know, on the, on the back end here, safety systems are the ones that prevent unsafe conditions from killing people you know, overpressure conditions on boilers from blowing up and killing people, over temperature conditions from, you know, ex- causing explosions or fires. Um, and so let's say there's a, a vulnerability that uh, uh, lets uh, somebody um, uh, crash the machine. You send a message, the magic, send the magic message to the machine and the machine crashes and reboots and it's down for, uh, you know, 30 seconds or five minutes depends how long it takes to reboot um how important is that on the main part of the control system it's fairly important you're probably going to take the plant down it's it's a reliability threat how important is that on your safety system well if your safety system is down for five minutes human life is at risk for those five minutes and so the safety system is more critical than the rest of the plant systems Arguably, you, you know, even if a, you know, cause the machine to reboot vulnerability is not as bad as, arb- you know, execute arbitrary code and do nasty stuff, it's still on the safety systems. It's 
they're that critical that you should be patching these lower lower priority vulnerabilities on the safety systems. On the other hand, if your safety systems, and you know many of them are air gapped, you cannot send them a message from any other machine. Well then, that vulnerability really isn't exposed on them, is it? And so you might say, yes, normally I would patch it, but because you know these safety systems versus those over there that are exposed, these ones are air gapped, I don't need to patch these ones as urgently as I do those ones over there that are on the network. So this is an example of where context drives the decision of a given vulnerability that you, you might patch in some circumstances and not in others. I guess my, my question is, let's say, I don't know, I put a firewall rule in or I, uh, I don't know, I install whitelisting or something. Um, I take some other measure. Um, what do I see in the system? How does, how does the system, does it, you know, does it notice that I've done this and recalculate how, you know, how, how does this, it's, it's, it's great that the system tells me, Hey, look, I'm in trouble, but does it come back and say, you're not in trouble anymore? Good job. Or, you know, how, how does that work? You're right. The basic premise is in that scenario, I'm going to look at something and my score, and you're right, I overlooked some of the more simple sort of approach potentially. The risk score says that I have a high risk. And when I dig in, there's a patch needed. Maybe I can do a compensating control. Or maybe the risk is because the backup or part of the risk score is because whitelisting isn't currently in lockdown or not installed on that device. Or the backup failed last night. Or, you know, we got this port or service that we really just need to disable and I can't do anything with it. So to your point, Let's install a firewall or an inline uh, in a network access control type of thing, or we can go rerun the backup, uh, or we can enable and install whitelisting. And to your question, because of the nature of the way we collect the data, we're continually connecting to the endpoints, we're continually remapping vulnerabilities, and we're continually connecting to antivirus and backup databases, you are correct. Once I make those changes, rerun the backup, install the whitelisting, configure the registry, that will then show up in my dashboard and I will see a reduction in risk. I will see less devices in that higher or critical category. I will see a trend over time that I had a whole bunch of five alarm fires and now I'm down to a couple or none. And you can actually see the improvement. And that's exactly what this dashboard is for, is to give you that near real-time view into the current status, which includes improvements as you do these things and recalculations, but it also includes obstacles or challenges as new vulnerabilities or threats are included because that's also injected. So it's a continually moving and evolving um, line. It's just like looking at a, at a trend line in a, in a operational facility when you're making power or, or, or oil, you're doing better and you see the productivity go up and the tank fill up and something goes wrong and you see it drop down the exact same sort of scenario. I was thinking about an example you gave uh, a little while ago, you know, the, the, the remote desktop example and the vulnerability that, you know, uh, let's say in remote desktop. Um, I'm wondering, is your is your system clever enough to say, hey, the vulnerability is in remote desktop, and look, they disabled the remote desktop on these devices. Therefore, it, it automatically reduces the risk. Is that how it works? Yeah, to an extent. I mean, in in the in the scenario you just gave, there's a couple of different indicators that would reduce reduce the risk score. Um, and those which are automatically gathered, like the whitelisting status is now in lockdown or the backup is now a success as opposed to a fail, that's automatically gathered, automatically updated, no problem. When you get to the more creative OT needs around compensating controls, like disabling remote desktop, <clears throat> we would, once we had done that, confirm that it was complete on however many assets we did it for. And then we would set a flag in the software to then um, not show those systems as still being vulnerable to that particular vulnerability because the first pass of mapping the vulnerabilities and as a patch there would say no, but we know we've applied compensating controls. So when I show the resulting dashboard to an OT practitioner, they see their true risk, not a, again, a, a false positive in that here's all these vulnerabilities because we know we've got those, those extra controls. And again, that's just, just another reinforcement for why you'd want to have multiple indicators, not just the vulnerability, but vulnerability plus how is it configured? Well, now we've got a different answer. We've got the true answer. I wanted to come back. You, you, uh, you said there was another, another topic. I think it was scaling, um, you know, how you use these numbers. Yeah, no, it, it's, this is the really powerful part, right? So the architecture that we, we instill 
um, and I, we touched upon it a little bit earlier, but the architecture that we instill means that you can bring in multiple facilities and all of your assets into a single view, which means you can have one small specialized team look at the fleet on behalf of the whole organization. You don't have individual sites having to dig in and be security experts and figure out what to do about this patch or that risk. Um, and then with that technology, you can then start to queue up um, activities. And I wanted to circle back to this especially because OT always gets really scared and you think some central IT guy is going to do something. I get it. Like I said, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've, I've seen a wrench in a, <laughs> in a firewall in the field um, through, through the physical hardware, uh, through the chassis. So let me just walk you through, through a quick case study. Um, we have a generation client that wanted to update a particular piece of software. In fact, they wanted to uninstall the software. They were afraid of its origins and the risks that were associated with it. And I'm not going to name anybody, but we all know that there's been a number of uh, companies that have fallen on the uh, fail, foul side of, of uh, many people's favor. Um, and so there they are on a Saturday afternoon. They've got sixth generation, coal fire generation, very complex environments. Um, and they're needing to remove this piece of software. And they're not sure how they're going to do it. There's a deadline. So what they do is they can go to the dashboard and they, in the software and they can see there's 146 copies of software spread across these six sites. Um, the central team is able to then initiate a request to uninstall the software. And I say request because while I've said earlier, we can make things like registry changes automatically, we don't always want to be messing in the OT space. We want to be very respectful. And usually uninstall of a software requires a reboot. So we send a request to 146 systems to uninstall the software. We send a detailed list to each site of exactly which physical room and rack this device is in. And when they get to the console, they will see a flashing light saying, would you like to accept this action? They are then able to phone the operator in the control room. They are then able to follow their own local change process. They're able to uninstall the software, bring it back online and move to the next one. And this particular client, anyone who's listening to this knows that this sort of activity, removing 150 copies of software from six locations, um, would take probably weeks or even maybe a couple of months of elapsed time, not, not, not uh, expended time, but just hunting and searching and finding the time. This activity was completed with a support person of one at the central and one individual at each of the six sites in and around their day job, it was completed in 90 minutes. And because of the update mechanism, we could see that in the software dashboard updating as they went around the flight. So this allows, we have a client with 700 facilities and a team of eight managing worldwide around the clock. So this is the future to me of where Verve, sorry, where OT security is going and how Verve is helping their clients to do it is there's not enough people and we need to start doing things. And so if we can combine context, ability to act, and OT safe, we start to really move the needle. So that's, you know, that's powerful. Automation is, is good automation on the security side. You know, I've been thinking about this interview though, and I know there are standards bodies, there are governments out there. There's a lot of debate going on saying, what are the right metrics? How do you measure risk in, in the OT world? Um, you know, I, I see people out there saying, well, you know, um, be careful how you measure risk. Uh, you know, if if your risk just keeps going up, your your board is going to be asking you why <laughs> why they're spending money on security if risk keeps going up. If uh, you know, so people are saying use use measures like how many of the top twenty controls have I implemented? Uh, you know, well, when you get to one hundred percent, you're done. Again, you, the the question becomes, you know, why am I spending money on this? The whole question of how do you measure risk seems hard, yet. You have a dashboard. You are, it, it seems to me, you are measuring risk. Can you talk about, about metrics and the value of metrics and, and you know, how, your, how your, your stakeholders, your customers respond to being able to see sort of a, a number that moves around in, in a predictable way reflecting risk? Yeah, and that's one of the things we haven't talked about yet is is the value of this insight. It it it, it goes from if you remember the example I gave earlier, the plant manager who told me you're gonna do an assessment and I, I already know I don't patch and I don't change passwords. How does that help me? That's the answer to this is once you have this data and you have the context, you can have empirical discussions about trends. And you're right, you don't the risk doesn't always go up, the risk does go down. Um, and so you can measure risk with this, what we primarily focus on today, which is pure risk in terms of vulnerabilities on assets and the impact of that asset. But once you go up a level, you can start to measure, well, I need to act in this behavior at this facility. But guess what? This flagship facility over here that either makes us more money or is more potentially 
catastrophic if it goes wrong, gets a different level of, of scrutiny and of support or, or, or funding. Um, and it's all empirically driven now. And you, you, you mentioned some of the, the, the regulatory standards. Um, outside of the pure risk score, we are getting more and more calls and more and more, more and more engagements to be helping clients to, to track and monitor compliance. And are we doing enough? Are we showing the auditors? Are we showing the board? Are we showing senior management? Are we using the money wisely? And are we making trends go in the right direction? Um, things like the CIS controls, we have a dashboard that shows here's your hardware inventory, here's your software, here's your configuration, here's your users. And you can look at it as a glance and show the CIO, look, we're doing the right things. Or look, we're going the wrong way. We need more help. Um, and the most recent one that we're quite proud of is actually that the federal government announced a, a CDM, Continuous Diagnostics and Monitoring, that all federal entities shall be reporting on, um, we've actually been been uh, approved as the OT response for that. So we're not only doing this internally within an organization or with an, with an organization towards helping them comply, but now we're also starting to share with external and federal sort of entities to really consume this data. It's really starting to catch on. Let me dive into this just a little bit. Visualizing risk is, you know, and measuring risk is is a is a big debate in the industry. Um, I gave you know some examples in in my question, but uh, I don't know if I don't know if my question made sense now that I listened to it again. Uh, Rick obviously got it, but let me go through it once more. Let's say um, you know there there are people out there saying you know risk should reflect uh, you know what's what's happening in the world. Well, there's always new vulnerabilities thousands and thousands of vulnerabilities being reported every every year. If you count them, your risk indicator is going up, your chart keeps going up. Um, qualitatively, we get we get word that, you know, the sophistication of, of the adversary is going up. They're using more and more powerful tools. They're using more and more powerful techniques. Again, the risk line keeps going up. If you show the board a risk line that goes up steadily, they ask the question, why are we spending money on you? You don't seem to be having any effect. So you can't show them that risk line. Um, you know, I've had, uh, I've had people tell me what you should do is use something like the top 20 controls and say, my goal is to get the top 20 controls implemented on every machine in my network. So I see a risk, you know, or I, I see a mitigation line going up, but eventually, you know, saying I'm getting better and better. Eventually I'm going to hit my 20 and I flatline. And again, the board goes, your, uh, security, the strength of your security posture seems to have flatlined. Why are we spending money on this again? Have you not solved this problem? Can we start spending less money on this? And of course, you know, you can't. That's that's the wrong measure as well. But what Rick's has described here, you know, their dashboard, imagine what the dashboard looks like. New vulnerabilities are discovered in the world and we do the risk calculation and some of them are relevant to our most critical systems and our calculation of risk goes up. You see the trend line going up. And the OT security team springs into action, you know, presses the button, figures out which machines most urgently need to be patched, patches those machines, or applies compensating measures to protect those machines, and the risk line goes down, saying, good, good job, you've uh, you've reduced your risk. And then, of course, there's more vulnerabilities over time, the risk line, risk line is going up and down, you can see progress, you can see that the money you're spending is you know, in the absence of spending money, the risk would go up unboundedly and you're spending the money. And so it keeps coming down. You can see, you know, that something good is happening. This is a step up from, you know, waving your hands at the, at the board. Um, it's still a qualitative metric. I mean, in the engineering space, you might be used to calculating like safety risk mathematically. You've got a, you know, one in a million chance of a death at the facility, you know, in the next year. Um, you don't have that kind of mathematical precision, but at least you've got something and it's something visual and it's something that in a, in a real sense makes sense. So, I, you know, I think this is a, a step in the right direction. Risk is a dry topic. Um, a lot of people, you know, uh, I, I, I speak at conferences if, you know, I've proposed, uh, you know, many presentations with risk in the title. Most of them don't get accepted. If I get accepted, nobody shows up because it's, you know, <laughs> it, people see it as, as academic, as, as not actionable. But, you know, metrics people are interested in, you know, and concrete advice as to where you know the 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 highest value investment next is that's huge so um you know thank you for for uh for joining us uh, you know these are 
to me, these are, are very positive developments in the in the field of the technology. Um, before we let you go, uh, you know, did you want to sum up for us? Is there are there words of wisdom you have for us? Uh, well, the things that I think are important, whether they're wise or not, uh, let the audience judge. But um, you know, I've been in this business, as I mentioned, at the top of the the, the call for twenty two years, and I've seen a lot of attempts at you know, the silver bullet and, and, you know, it was whitelisting in, in 09 and uh, it's, it's other promises since then. And, and even some notable public speakers saying, well, we can't patch why bother. Let's just give up and, and, and hunker down. But the reality is that this can happen. We just need to be prepared to roll our sleeves up and get at it. Um, why we've been avoiding addressing the, the technical and security debt we continue to amass and compile over adding more technologies and IOT and then being surprised at how much risk there is, is it, it's a bit baffling to me. Um, you've been on the circuit as long or longer than I have, Andrew, and you know that some of the things we say, we've been saying for 20 years and still people nod their head and write it down as it's sage advice, right? So um, I I think that we're seeing a turn that people are um, embracing the fact that, yeah, I really do need to get into it. I really do need the data because I need to make informed decisions. There's only so many people, so many dollars, and there's so much risk. I need to be I need to be creative. I need to be precise uh, and I need to be effective. And so um, I'm quite excited at what we're seeing. Um, and I would I would heartily recommend that you dig into a, how you actually get to those endpoints because that's where the data resides, that's where the risk resides, and that's where the solution uh, ultimately resides as well. And if you do want to dig deeper, uh, you know we have always taken these case studies, uh, user testimonials, uh, public presentations of of how some of these things are impl- from from the end users, not from us. Um, our resource page we just recently published a couple of new white papers on exactly these types of topics, but also again some of the use cases that actual frontline industry peers of yours uh, speaking to the audience here um, that are doing this and realizing the benefits. We have some that are accelerating five-year programs down into, you know, two and a half to three years. And I think there's some real valuable insights from people frontline, you know, not the talking heads like me and Andrew. Um, and you really probably should dig into that. And you can also probably sign up for a webinar or two while you're there because we do those every month as well. So I hope this helps. And please do dig into the educational content we have up there. And if anybody's curious, please feel free to reach out. Andrew, that was your interview with Rick Kahn. Do you have any final thoughts to take us out with today? I was really encouraged by the episode. I mean, um, you know, this is automation. This is automation for security. You know, it's it's a truism that our enemies' attacks are getting more sophisticated because they're automating their attacks, because our enemies are using more and more sophisticated automation. Here is automation for our defenses uh here is a way to you know uh, this kind of automation can can uh you know take a lot a lot of time off of the analysis part of our defenses off of the uh, the implementation part of our defenses you know automating the defenses uh you know sounds extremely useful you know this sounds like a very effective kind of automation so you know i i see this as good news as, as a very positive development okay well then thanks to rick for Uh, enlightening us today. And thank you, Andrew, for speaking with me. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Nate. This has been the Industrial Security Podcast from Waterfall. Thanks to everybody out there listening.